Activism and Advocacy for Bringing About Change for Abused Older Women. This learning module will focus upon community-based activism and advocacy work that is currently being undertaken in Australia to advance research, policy, and practice on violence against older women. This module contains four learning objectives. One, become familiarized with the issues facing older women and the values and activities of the Older Women's Network in Australia. Two, enhance understanding of how to conduct participatory and collaborative research with and for older women who are victims of abuse. Three, identify how activism and research can be used to develop strategies for structural change on the issue of violence against older women. Four, recognize the need for networking and collaborating across sectors and with older women to create sustainable services and equitable policy. In this module, you will be provided opportunities to reflect on the information presented. When necessary, you may pause and start this video or refer to linked resources in the description box for further information as they appear. To open the description box, simply click on Show More below the video. At the end of the module, click the link below to be directed to a certificate of completion. The full biography of our presenter, Dr. Jane Mears, is available below. Now let's get started. What I've tried to do is look at about a 30-year um, struggle, I guess, a 30-year history um, of, of work trying to bring together the intersections of elder abuse and domestic violence, and most importantly, to acknowledge and to in indeed to fight um, for the rights of older women and to try and make up for past discrimination and inequality that hits us as we age. Um, I'm talking about just one organisation and it's actually in New South Wales, Australia. So although quite a lot of what I say applies to Australia overall, like Canada, we're a very large country and we're also a federation. So like you, we're fighting and indeed developing both innovative and indeed hideous strategies um, at both state and federal level. So over the last 30 years, we've had a very, very strong community-based women's movement and we've worked really hard hard to, to, to learn from each other, from the best of the states, um, uh, the activity that's going on in the states, and indeed um, we, we brought that together in the federal sphere. But it's been a fairly rocky road and we've been um, subject to the contingencies often of very conservative governments. To begin, our first learning objective is to become familiarised with the issues facing older women and the values and activities of the Older Women's Network in Australia. We've as I say, this is, this is a story of an organisation um, that's been working um, over a period of um, 30, 30 years. Um, and of course, our statistics are no different, but I present them slightly differently, as you can see here. And I've adopted uh, 45 plus, and we, we, we adopted that age after we produced a report that I'll talk about as I get a little bit further down the track, the disappearing age. Um, and we adopted the 45 plus for our Indigenous women. Their, their lifespan is much, much shorter. Um, and at 45, many of us are actually uh, starting to really feel the impacts of past discrimination and what's happening to us. Older age for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is generally considered 45 to 50 years due to their lower life expectancy than non-Indigenous peoples. So, for example, at 45, for, for most of us, if we lose our jobs, if we're subject to any chronic illnesses, the calculation in Australia is most of us have about a week or two before we're homeless. We're all really, really vulnerable once we hit 45. Um, and, of course, we can talk a lot more about that. So the emphasis on, of this presentation really is on structural, uh, a structural framework and historical uh, uh, inequality and the cumulative effects of that and to, to, to use that as a backdrop to, to uh, preventing violence against women. Um, in Australia, older women make up the majority of people who are caring for older people as informal carers, working as care workers and home care work, uh, as home care workers, both in nursing, uh, residential care, and in home care. Um, and uh, 
we are also the largest majority of people, uh, majority of people, women are in receipt of home care services, and the majority of people living in residential care are also older women. Um, and I argue, as, as I'm sure all of you will as well, um, that we're the young hung heroes, often treated as absolutely invisible, we're not even counted, and indeed, it's it's um, we've all worked really hard to count. Uh, you know, the informal, I, I, I call particularly on the work of my colleague, Marilyn Waring, who many of you are probably very familiar with, um, and her counting for nothing, which was a, 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 an abs I, I found a, a truly aha moment when I first read Marilyn's work and heard her speak um, in terms of recognising the, the contribution that women, women make. Um, and of course, older women make major contributions throughout their lives. We've brought up families, we're still um, dealing with, with grandchildren, and indeed the majority of those volunteering within the community um, are, are older women. We raise grandchildren, we're mentors and models for younger women. And we have a wealth of knowledge and experience and understanding that we can see, as I've said, is, is rarely um, acknowledged. The Older Women's Network was set up um, in 1987 to promote the rights, dignity and well-being of older women and to advocate on behalf of older women. Um, it came about when a group of older women who'd been very active in the women's movement um, and indeed were senior, had, be, had been senior bureaucrats and many of them working um, in the DV sector, we had a very active set of policies that started to come into, uh, women's policies that started to come into play post-1972 uh, when the Whitlam government was elected, so it was quite early on. Um, and these women joined the Combined Pensioners Association and realised that it was dominated by men, the men wouldn't listen to them, they they couldn't get voted into any positions. Their, their needs were not acknowledged at all. And these feisty, intelligent, wonderful women uh, formed um, the Older Women's Network. Um, and mission statement, own beliefs in a society rich in social capital where mutual respect and trust are paramount, where diversity and debate are valued, and where people and their networks have a, have a legitimate voice. Back in 1987, there was an organisation called Combined Pensioners and there was a feisty woman by the name of Noreen Hewitt who was a member of Combined Pensioners and she thought that women, older women, were not being taken into account and that there were things affecting older women that were not affecting older men to the same extent. From a pilot project of the Combined Pensioners Association, the Older Women's Network was born. All the programs, all the stuff we do is managed, um, initiated and organised by older women for older women. You go from existing, you be, you're conscious that you've become invisible, that people don't even notice what you're doing, and then you totally disappear. Now once we hit, it depends, you know, for many I was 55, walk into a shop, Particularly, I walk with a stick. I'm virtually invisible. Unwilling to be invisible in the community, Own's founding aim was to highlight the discrimination older women face and to give them a voice on issues that concern them. Over 30 years on, Own New South Wales continue to actively promote the rights, dignity and well-being of all older women. We look very carefully at who's being marginalised, we look at what's happening to people in our society and indeed older women are the most discriminated against of any social group, um, structural discrimination and indeed individual discrimination um, and we work towards alleviating that discrimination. Own's unique contribution is to bring the perspective of older women to bear on the general range of issues that are important for older people in New South Wales. To ensure that the older women's perspective is heard, Own New South Wales lobby government, lodge submissions to public inquiries, address the media and conduct and publish research. 
Now, research can show us what's happening. It can show us, tell those stories of older women and tell us uh, what's happening and how it's advantaging older women. And unless we research it, unless we write it up, no one will ever know. That's the prime importance of research to the, social, to the older women's network, is to, first of all, make a space within which older women can tell their stories, older women can be recognised. Secondly, to bring that to the public agenda. Integral to OWN's advocacy work is the OWN Theatre Group, who raise awareness of the serious issues facing older women with an entertaining range of songs and short skits. And it was the theatre group that really attracted me to join OWN. Don't Not Your Granny is one of probably four or five half a dozen shows that we have. I think it's one of the most profoundly moving shows because it really does show the issues that affect some people as they get older and the fact that when older women become isolated and voiceless it becomes extremely difficult. I hope people go away from the show and start conversations. Own New South Wales exists as a network of groups across the state. Own groups meet on a regular basis to gather socially or to offer activities that include guest speakers, discussions and outings. Some Own New South Wales groups operate as wellness centres, offering affordable, facilitated classes to enhance members' health and wellbeing. Offering so much more though than just their wide range of classes, own wellness centres provide older women with an opportunity to enhance their social connections and emotional well-being. What women are often not as aware of though is that the social participation that our classes offer and the social connection with the other women that attend the groups and the classes and the activities is it has actually been found to be even more important to older women's well-being than the physical exercise is. It's the outing, it's the type of activity and it's the social aspect I think that is very important for older women. What's your idea of an older woman? How old? And they said, oh we don't really have a, you don't need a passport to get in or anything. And then I thought about it and I thought, oh well I'm not, well, I, I guess I would count myself as an older woman so I'm, you know, I, I actually feel really at home here. What we say is that any woman who identifies as older is very welcome to join our classes or join any of our groups. I just love it. I really, really love it. That gives you some idea of the scope of the Old Women's Network, and I mean, it's it is uh, as as I said, it's it's a magnificent um, group of women, and we all work incredibly hard and mostly really well together. Um, and as Marnie said, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the wellness centres at the end. Um, our wellness centres, which provide. Uh, we, we try and keep them as cheap as we possibly can um, because most of the women who come uh, to our centres and indeed who, in, who are involved in the network um, have, very, uh, 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 have very few economic resources. So we've always been very careful um, to make things incredibly cheap and to, to um, you know, provide opportunities for as many women as we possibly can. Um, we don't exclude people. Now that we are familiar with the Older Women's Network, we can enhance our understanding of how to conduct participatory and collaborative research with and for older women who are victims of abuse through examples provided by Dr. Jane Mears. So this is our sort of, if you like, our, our principles in terms of our own research um, and it'll be familiar to all of you. I'm assuming that probably everybody in this room would hopefully follow similar uh, principles in the research that they're doing whatever 
uh, group they're, they're, they're working with. In this particular instance, of course, we're talking about older women and our research, of course, uh, concentrates on promoting research by and for older women, challenging gender and age-based stereotypes, prioritising the experience of, of older women and creating space where our voices can be heard. We place the issue of violence against older women, or trying to, at the forefront of policy development, and we're building on strategic ongoing relationships between older women, advocacy, community groups, service providers and policy makers. Now, I just need to stop there for a minute and just mention, of course, that the organisation has been going for 30 years. This has not happened overnight. I mean, as you would all be aware, uh, most, most of us who have worked in the community uh, have been very, very well networked, and of course, we've had some major um, uh, and, and very important community-based networks that have made major contributions and so we're building on those relationships and of course we have to redo it most of the time with the polys because they just come in they, they're not aware of this history however having said that though we now have quite a number um, of women uh, politicians in Australia who have actually come out of out of our uh, out of the women's movement who we've actually many of us have worked with in the past as well and we have personal relations with. So that's working, of course, in our favour. Live long enough and, you know, we, you, these sorts of things come round. Um, most importantly, um, we have a... Have a um, underpinning our, our, our research is uh, advoc advocating for structural change to prevent violence against older women and also, of course, to support older women in dealing with past trauma and abuse. And that is one area that has been really overlooked and um, uh, we, we, we need to do a lot of work around uh, the effects of re-traumatisation, the, the, the very complex interactions um, and in the experiences of women um, over, over the whole of their lives. Research has shown that older women's experience of violence is often related to prior experiences of abuse throughout the entire life course. In addition, we must also remember that older women are not a uniform group, but have lived experiences that are further shaped by circumstances of power, such as colonialism and racism, and unique identities including sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. So essentially we're trying to, to move away from the medical model um, and shift the paradigm, and again, you'd all be very familiar for, with this, from one that blames the individual, that poor passive old woman lying in the nursing home with her two black eyes, um, to a systemic um, issue and um, a... Um, uh, uh, a paradigm that analyzes the impact of ageism, most importantly, and challenges structural discrimination and recommends uh, ways forward. Participatory action research is a type of action research which is the systematic collection and analysis of data for the purpose of taking action and making change. The participatory aspect of this type of research emphasizes the inclusion of all participants within all phases of the research process, so that they may engage in social change on issues that affect them. Let's take a minute to reflect on the practicality of implementing participatory action research with older women. One of the challenges of participatory action research is to maintain the inclusion of community members over time throughout the research process. What strategies might you use to engage older women who have experienced violence over the duration of the research project? Consider the social issues that would be most relevant to this group, the accessibility of the research location, balancing power and responsibility across the full research team. Feel free to pause the video to participate in this exercise. When you are ready, press start to hear about an example of participatory action research conducted with the Older Women's Network. Um, we spoke to about 
uh, 270 older women, and this was the first project that had ever been done with older women in Australia talking about their experiences of violence. And they told stories from across their lifespan. I went in, we recruited through two agencies, my colleague Margaret Sargent and myself, uh, and they were women's health services, one in Campbelltown that I'd worked with very closely for a long, long time, and one down the south coast. And they were very, very keen to participate in the research. And they'd actually, at that point in 2000, they'd had set up support groups for older women um, who were either escaping or had escaped violence and we, we were, um, they gave, a, they, they were very happy, uh, these women, to participate and to tell their stories and of course the sort of stories they were telling, it was very much from their perspective, I don't want this to happen to anybody else, I want people to know that this is what happened to me, I'm not whinging but it's happened to many, many other people and I want it to change, that was the, that was the, the, the thrust. Um, of what they were talking about. Um, and so we went in, um, you know, to talk to women about their, their violence, and I was expecting in them to come in and talk about what had happened to them in the last year or two. Now, almost to a woman, they spoke about a whole history of violence, and they included, um, as which I didn't anticipate, um, things that had happened to them when they'd been sacked unnecessarily, where they'd been, um, uh, you know, had major chronic illnesses and had been removed from the workforce, as well as their interpersonal relationships and the way that they'd been treated. And the stories were very evocative, very moving, and certainly, um, you know, they were very, very courageous. And of course, it confirmed to us what we already knew, um, that violence against older women in the home, which was what we were looking at, was a really significant um, social problem. We produced a, a resource, a, a small book of women's stories, and we also produced two reports for professionals um, and um, uh, uh, for uh, older women themselves. Did quite a lot of work, as one should, uh, with uh, politicians and community organisations, disseminating our results and making sure that everybody knew what was going on. Moving on to learning objective three, we will now identify how activism and research can be used to develop strategies for structural change on the issue of violence against older women. Now, we got the feeling, and of course part of it was we were living through periods um, of conservative government, particularly in New South Wales, but also we had some pretty awful experiences federally. And in 2006, when the Labor government was uh, elected federally, we thought, look, window of opportunity, we'll, we'll get back in again. Um, and so we, we set up this campaign to foster a national debate, um, to develop a comprehensive national strategy, and to secure uh, commitments from governments to implement uh, strategies. The theoretical framework underpinning the campaign was rights-based, and we looked at the social context, the marginalisation of and discrimination against older women, with the recognition that older women are more vulnerable uh, to abuse and violence on a societal and indeed an individual level. Our first report was the disappearing age. We tried to get whatever statistics we could about older women. And of course, uh, the ABS statistics that, that had been collected, there was a, a big study in the mid 90s on violence against women, and it only went up to 55. Um, and the, the latest category from 55 to 75, which was a very small cohort indeed, um, was barely mentioned. When you looked at the fine print in the ABS, um, a lot of people, older women, had actually filled in the first half of the survey and then they were either able to opt in or out when they got to the violence bit where they wanted to talk about it and just about all the older women opted out. So there were no responses, well when I say no, the response rate was very, very low which is hardly surprising given the nature um, as, and, and indeed as you frame your study the way you collect your data is obviously going to have a huge impact on the data that you get and so they, they found what they thought was the case. Um, we came out of that with a, a strategy, um, and it's actually pages and pages long. We had, um, this is just a, uh, the introduction, uh, promote awareness and visibility of violence, create a safe and, and supportive environment, and most importantly, places where, safe places where people can talk about their experiences, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, uh, and we, we know from our research on support groups that, and indeed from our earlier research, from the research that we, we've done over the years, that support groups are something that women find incredibly useful. I mean, this comes out of the, the, of course, the domestic violence movement when we were using um, support groups as a strategy, supporting each other. 
guess what? It works with older women as well, of course. Refer to the description box to be linked to research on support groups with older women survivors of violence. Um, so we wanted to improve the ability of support services to identify violence against older women because like everywhere else, I mean, there's very little acknowledgement in ageing services, in health services, um, that older women... Um, are, that's why we called our report The Disappearing Age. Older women just disappear from all the statistics, uh, from 45 on. That was the other reason we used 45. Um, provide a appropriate uh, and proportionate levels of support to older women. And most importantly, ensure that all workers, those in the violence sector and those in the aged services sector, are aware, well-trained and able to respond appropriately to the needs of older women. And we also suggested that a good idea would be to put together in the same classes, in the same courses, um, those that had worked in ageing, who had expertise, working with older people and older women, and indeed those that were working with younger women and the DV services, so they could compare uh, the sorts of strategies they were using Using, and they could open up each other's eyes in terms of what was required in the other in the in the other sector. Um, so essentially, to promote collaborative, integrated, and community-based responses uh, across key agencies and staff supporting older women. Um, we came up, as I said, with a huge range of recommendations. They're really. Um, uh, fantastic ambit claims in terms of you know how we'd like to see the world run um, and we looked at of course family violence services we looked at homelessness and social housing medical and health services community justice and legal centers uh, sorry sectors and improved collaboration and we we of course um, spent some time talking about the issues around ageism and community awareness of, of what was actually going on um, one of the things that we found uh, when we were trying to collect the statistics, we went to every agency we could think of that might have disaggregated uh, statistics in terms of gender and age uh, to try and get sort of that grey, uh, those grey statistics. And we went, we had very good relationships and still have with the homelessness agencies in, um, in New South Wales and indeed nationally. And of course they were getting government funding, it's called SAP Supported Accommodation, uh, through the Supported Accommodation Project, to house homeless people. And in 2006, there was a massive campaign, which was partly why we, we did this too, um, to put homelessness onto the social agenda in Australia, clearly a huge issue. Um, by the time we looked at these stats, it was pretty clear, yes, it was a huge issue, but it wasn't the guys that were sitting around in the parks. I mean, obviously, their situation is dire, but the bulk of the people that were homelessness presenting to these services were actually older women. Um. Now that we understand how activism and research can be used to influence structural change, we turn to our last learning objective, which is recognize the need for networking and collaborating across sectors and with older women to create sustainable services and equitable policy as identified in Dr. Mira's study of older women and homelessness. So the next study we did was It Could Be You, and that was around older women and homelessness to, to push this issue more. We actually uh, built alliances um, with many of the homelessness agencies, Homelessness Australia, the New South Wales ones as well, and we uh, they worked with us, um, and we went to their services, and Luda, actually, uh, McFerrin, whose uh, name's down the bottom there, did the, the interviews, and she interviewed 30 um, older women uh, using homeless services and put forward a whole series of case studies. And indeed, most of these women, as, as um, you would probably realise from your own experiences, had never expected to be homeless. They found themselves um, in a situation that they never thought they would be in. And indeed, the more you research this area, the more you realise how vulnerable every single one of us is. I mean, a, a marriage breakdown, loss of a job, a terrible accident, and, you know, you can well... Uh, lose your home, or indeed you can be you know, your, your son, your daughter, uh, your husband will rip you off and that's, that's it, you, you, you're homeless. So um, our conclusion was that being older and single um, and female 
is to be at severe risk of becoming homeless, a, a very stark message um, to all older women, but more importantly also a stark message to how important it is to work across sectors. I mean, there's no point treating somebody in hospital um, and sending them home if they haven't got a home, or organising home care services to keep people at home if they haven't got a home. So, I mean, it's pretty, it's not rocket science, obviously. We have we set up the wellness centres um, first of all uh, in the uh, mid 90s I think, um, and the wellness centres were, as you can see from the quote there, focused on local women, women consulting with other local women about what they needed in order to maintain a sense of wellness and manage the pressure in their lives. And as I say, there was always um, that you can see down the bottom there. The aim was really to provide affordable and sustainable community-based services for older women. We got a small grant to start up the first one in uh, Bankstown, which is in the west of Sydney, a pretty disadvantaged um, and very multicultural area, um, which indeed has, thank you, um, a lot of um, um, uh, women who are particularly marginalised. and. Um, that, uh, but, uh, apart we, so we had the grant for that centre um, and that person who, who started that centre became the coordinator as the other centres were sent up. But the centres themselves are run to totally by the women in those communities and they're run differently. Um, and the women are all very ne well networked in their communities. They've spent their lives working in the school PNCs, working in the various community agencies um, and they know their communities well um, and they can get access to some of the local councils have been incredibly supportive and given uh, very cheap premises to the to the um, uh, well, well free premises actually uh, to the to the women. Um, other councils haven't been as as generous, so they run differently in each um, in a, each of the six centres runs differently, and they offer different sorts of activities. And you saw um, some of the activities on the on the film. And of course, as Marnie said um, in her in her speech, we've been under a lot of pressure from the uh, Department of Health, which provides this piddling little bit of funding. That we're very grateful, very grateful, um, <laughs> uh, to justify our, our existence. <laughs> and we're continually asked uh, you know, to provide an evaluation that shows that these centres are really uh, you know, working to uh, improve the lives of older women. So we've started a number of projects and tried to build them in with what we're doing um, as well, because obviously we, we just don't have the resources to do major evaluations. And frankly, I, I find you know, sort of counting people and trying to work this stuff out, when you can see what's happening on the ground, um, you know, pretty pretty tricky. But anyway, that's that's how government works. We know that you've got to you've got to make your case. So we've now got six Bankstown. Uh, well, we probably don't know Sydney, so there's probably not much point reading out. You can see them up there where they are, um, and we're starting up two more um, in regional areas within the next six months or so. Um, as I said, community and relationship based, affordable, flexible, um, accessible, and the idea is to enhance social and emotional wellbeing, opportunity to have fun, make new friends, find support and engage in local community activities. Um, the own wellness centres foster strong relationships and networks that provide conclusive, inclusive, affordable uh, support for older women uh, with over overarching sustainable policies and practices. And they've been going now for quite some time, so hopefully, you know, they, they will. Uh, they are indeed um, sustainable, and I've of course spent quite a lot of time going around talking to women at the centres, and they all talk about um, the social connectedness, talking to other women. Uh, they've started up a lot of support groups depending on what the needs are of those women in the community. So cancer support groups, uh, support groups for women who have been recently widowed, and indeed for those that are escaping violence. But I think a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, which is what's so hard to evaluate, takes place informally and you don't really know. Um, one of the women was telling me that she'd left a violent relationship with the help of two of her friends in the older women's network. You don't need many people, she said. I had two and that was how I got out of my violent relationship. Um, we've had a number of uh, Australian inquiries recently. This is just moving things forward a little bit. Um, and as I say, we actively participate in all these. And I, 
I want to make the point that the Older Women's Network, part of what I'm talking about is our ability to network and our ability to work with other agencies and indeed the incredible length of and experience of these women who have worked both as bureaucrats, in communities and across the sector. I mean, between the however many hundred of us there are, uh, we have connections all over. Um, you know, at, at, at levels of government, um, in major NGOs. I've been, I'm a university academic, um, and I've been teaching uh, now, I, I teach social work, community work for oh, well over 30 years in Western Sydney. All over Western Sydney, I have this massive network of fantastic graduates. I mean, obviously, the ones who didn't like me, I don't meet up with, but there, <laughs> um, there are a lot of, you know, incredibly committed uh, people, and they've all come out of often, um, you know, very poor. Um, my university uh, is often the first in family to graduate with a degree. So, you know, and these people are now working in the services in Western Sydney. You know, it's obviously, you know, it's, it's great working, working with these people over this long period of time. Um, just a couple of inquiries we've had recently. That we've had a lot more, but these, these are just a couple that I'd mention. Uh, the Royal Commission into Family Violence in Victoria, which has been particularly impressive, um, and the National Inquiry into Elder Abuse. Now, I mention both of those because both were underpinned clearly by a human rights approach and an understanding of the ways in which age um, and gender intersect. And they spend a lot of time talking about, you know, past past injustices, structural discrimination, and, you know, if you're going to look, uh, I think the Australian Law Reform Commission, which is the, the body that undertook the National Inquiry, um, were, I mean, it was a... When I say a surprise, I, I mean, I know the President, uh, Rosalind, uh, very, very well, and I knew she'd do a really good job, but I was blown away by what a good job she did. There was none of this legal nitpicking, none of the stuff we need, an overall policy, the law is part of this, but, you know, we have to do a whole lot of other things um, as well. She's just been appointed to the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, so we have now Rosalind Croucher working um, as President, so she's very aware of all these issues, and we're, of course, as I said to her sweetly, we're expecting great things. Um, the recommendations build on promising policies and practices in intervening um, and uh, preventing violence against older people. Um, so, uh, just in conclusion, main aim, shift the paradigm from one that focuses on the individual to a paradigm that am analyses um, and indeed challenges the impact um, of ageism. And that's supposed to read, of course, challenges structural violence, which I don't know how that word disappeared, but look, phew, um, things happen. Uh, violence against older women is not a personal problem, it's a public issue. It's everybody's problem, and indeed at a global issue of central concern to, to governments, and in Australia like you, we're working across so many governments, federal, state, local, um, and indeed the issue is one that needs to be taken up by all those ministries. Um, so we need to all work together, the ageing sectors, long-term care, the health sectors, housing sectors, women's sectors, domestic violence, and of course the elder abuse services, of which we have very few in Australia. Um, but most importantly, I think we need to all listen to um, and support older women helping ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> there are several important messages that arise from Dr. Mira's presentation. These include, community-based organizations for older women should be created by older women and should advocate for equitable resources and appropriate services and support. Two, research conducted for and by older women should challenge ageist and sexist stereotypes, assess abuse across the lifespan, update current understandings of violence against older women, and create spaces to allow the voices of older women to be heard. And three, Researchers, community workers, and advocates should work across sectors and with governments to promote awareness and visibility of violence against older women.
Thank you for completing the learning module, Activism and Advocacy for Bringing About Change for Abused Older Women. Click the link below to be directed to a short survey and a certificate of completion.